Today we're in chapter 47 and 48. And to be honest with you, uh, this is something that I'm going to spend more time on verses 1 through 12 because uh, you'll see in a moment why I'm going to do that. But let me read to you verses 1 through 12 in chapter 47, introduce our study and get into, get into our conclusion of our series here in the book of Ezekiel. Beginning at verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate, led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits. He brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankle. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000, brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. For the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned there, along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. He said to me, this water flows through the eastern region, goes down into the valley, Chino Valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Aglim. Uh, they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea, exceedingly many. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Along the bank of the river on the side of that will grow all kinds of trees used for food, their leaves will not wither, their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, their leaves for medicine. Chapter 47, chapter 48 of the book of Ezekiel. Give to us the closing details, uh, especially that are related to the division of the land of Israel during the time that Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning, which is called the millennial kingdom or the thousand-year reign. Now, God had made a promise all the way in the Old Testament to a man by the name of Abram, also known as Abraham. And God had said in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, concerning this land that is called the land of promise, God had said to him, to your descendants, I will give this land. Now, the geography that is going to be uh, given to us in chapter 48, especially chapters 47, 48, speaking concerning these things, uh, is actually larger than the boundaries that were originally given to Moses that are recorded in Numbers chapter 34. But as we look at this and as we think about it, um, the giving of the land uh, to the Jews actually fulfilled God's promises to restore them to the land. They had been scattered from the land, and at last they're being brought back to it, and once again they're going to live there. And so what is going to happen in this time is it's going to be divided up. It's going to be divided into parcels and separated for the tribes. It's going to be uh, parcels for the sanctuary. There's going to be land that is designated for priests and Levites. And there's going to be land for the prince who's going to be ruling under the, uh, under the Messiah. Jerusalem itself is going to be uh, a square. It's going to be uh, a square with each side being 1.5 miles. And so he basically, when you look at these these chapters, that's what you see. You see a division of the land. You see these kinds of things in these details. And so if you want, you can read that when you go home. I'm sure you already read it before you came. And you've seen that's what this is. What I really want to concentrate on, though, is the practical application of verses 1 through 12. That's really what we're going to spend our time looking at today because as we look at this, what we have in these verses is a vision, a vision that has been referred to as the vision of living water. As you've noticed with me when we began this and began to read, the water is flowing out from the temple from under the threshold, but this water is coming from the altar. So right from the beginning, if we're going to be looking at this in a practical way, one, we're going to see that the water, in a moment we're going to see that it represents the Holy Spirit, 
But what we're going to be seeing is that the water originates from the altar, and therefore all blessings from God begin at the altar. All blessings from God begin at the altar. In New Testament terms, all blessings originate at the altar, the place of sacrifice. All blessings originate at the cross of Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ came offering himself up for us. He made sacrifice for us, and it's through his grace that we receive all of his blessings. And it's by his death that God has made for us the provision for us to have the blessings of the Lord, especially that are given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus in John chapter 16 was speaking on one occasion, he said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper or the comforter, the parakletos, will not come to you. But if I depart, Jesus said, I will send him to you. Jesus is departing. He departs in the sense that when he died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, ascended into heaven, that is all part of the, the plan God had in the sending of the Holy Spirit who is going to indwell us, and therefore the blessings are going to originate at that altar of sacrifice. Now, as we look at this, the water that we see flowing from under the threshold, the water that is there south of the altar that is coming out and pouring out, well, this water that is flowing symbolizes the Holy Spirit. When you read your Bible, you're going to see that there are what are called types or there are, there are symbols of the work of God or the things of God, and, and, and water very often is used to illustrate the Spirit of God. Sometimes you'll see fire is illustrating the Spirit of God. Uh, sometimes you'll see it illustrated through the words, the new wine, uh, there are various things that are used sometimes, various ways that the Spirit is spoken of. It can be wind or breath. But, but very often what you see in the New Testament that symbolizes the Holy Spirit and the activity of the Holy Spirit is water. And so that's the picture that we have here. The blessings of God that are flowing from the altar would be a picture of God ministering to man by the power of His Spirit. Now, without, without God, man is dry. Without God, man is barren. So what God does is God promises to pour water on man. In Isaiah 44, verse 3, he said it this way. He said, I'll pour water on him who is thirsty, floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants, my blessing on your offspring. You need to be thirsty and realize that you're dry. And God says, I'm going to pour my water on you. And so it requires me to be aware of my dry condition. There needs to be a, a spiritual thirst in my life. And in, in that, I can have that spiritual thirst quenched by God himself. The psalmist David in Psalm 63, verse 1, said it like this. He said, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So God is here in Ezekiel 47 giving us a picture of the flowing of the Holy Spirit and the blessings that originate in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When you look at this, and I want you to see this, you see it in verses 3, 4, and 5, you actually have a progression. I want you to see how he speaks of it. In verse 3, he says, the water came up to my ankles. In verse 4, he says, the water came up to my knees. Then he says, the water came up to my waist. And then in verse 5, he says, the water is too deep. It's water in which one must swim. And so what you see is you see the Holy Spirit in his activity in the life of a believer. When he says the water came up to my ankle, ankles, this would symbolize the walk of a believer. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. When he says in verse 4, it came up to my knees, it symbolizes the prayer life of a believer that is energized by the Holy Spirit. It's like when Jude said in verse 20, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, he says, the water came up to my waist. This would be a picture of the service of a Christian because we need the Spirit to energize us in order that our lives might be pleasing to God. Paul in Romans 8, verse 8 said, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then finally in verse 5, he says, the water is too deep. It's something that you must swim in. And that speaks, and that's what I really want to spend time looking at with you today, 
That speaks of the abundance of the Spirit of God in the life of a Spirit-filled believer. God's Spirit. Is there anything missing in the life of believers today? And the answer would be, if there's one thing that seems to be obvious, is that many believers have a tendency of walking in the flesh and not in the Spirit. Many believers have a tendency of, of yielding to the things of their flesh and not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what God wants to do is He wants us to have living water from a running spring in our life. There's an interesting story found in the Gospel of John chapter 4. All of us are familiar with it as we read our Bibles. You know the story there that is found concerning a woman who is at a well in the uh, region of Samaria. The Bible in John chapter 4 speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he needed to go into Samaria. And as he had entered into Samaria, his disciples had gone off to get some food. And Jesus is seated by a well. It's called the Well of Sychar. It's a well that was originally owned by the patriarch Jacob. And as Jesus is there by noon, a woman approaches with her water pot. And as she approaches this particular well, those who are familiar with Jewish culture and geography would know that this woman who's coming at noon is coming at noon for a reason. And the reason she's coming at noon, which is the hottest portion of the day, is because she's an outcast. When you read the, the, the study there, when you read chapter 4 and you see what God is saying to us there, you, you'll realize that just by the conversation that she has with the Lord Jesus Christ because when she walks up to the well and she has her water jug there, her water pot that she's going to fill with water and take back, Jesus begins to speak to her. Now, it's obvious she's an outcast because in that day, the, the women did come and get the water but they normally would get the water either in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening, late afternoon. They never would approach the well during the day at noon because that's the hardest, hottest portion of the day. The women of the village would normally congregate by that well. And so that's where the women would speak about their family life and, and just have, have you know, conversations one with another. That was a place of fellowship with the ladies. But this woman, this woman at the well comes by herself indicating to us that she is not one of those women, and there's a reason why. So as she comes to that well, Jesus is there, and he looks at her, and he actually breaks the taboo because he speaks to her, and he says to her, give me a drink. Now, she looks at him startled, and she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And John tells us because the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The Samaritans were a hated group of people. This woman belonged to a group, a race, that the Jews had no respect for because the Jews had had problems with them early on in their history because the Samaritans were actually a group of people that were a mixture of Jewish as well as various other nations. And what they had done is they had introduced idolatry into the nation of Israel there from Samaria. And so the Jews had a hatred that was long-standing for centuries by the time this woman came and spoke to Jesus Christ. And that's why she says to him, how is it that you being a Jew are speaking to me? One, men do not speak like this in public to women. This doesn't happen in our society. And secondly, you're Jewish and I'm a Samaritan. And how is it that you're having any dealings with me? And, and by the way, when Jesus says to her, give me a drink, he's saying to her, I'm giving you a call to serving me. He's calling her to service, the service of the Lord. And so as she's speaking to him, she's wondering how he could speak to her in that way. But Jesus says, then I'm an, I'm an awful lot more than what you see. He says to her, if you knew who I was, you would ask for me living water and I would give it to you to drink. So immediately as he says that, he begins to, to, to get her curiosity up. And so she says to him, where are you going to get this living water from? I notice that you don't have a water pot. How's that going to happen? How are you going to do this? How are you going to get living water? And, and who are you anyway? Are you greater than our father Jacob who, who owned this well, who drank from this well, who, who gave water to his children from this well and watered his animals from this well? Are you greater than Jacob? And as she asks that question, Jesus' response is recorded in John 4, verses 13 and 14. And he says this to her. He says, Whosoever drinks of this water will thirst again. 
But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He's saying the Spirit of God is going to give to you something that is superior to anything you've ever had. The Spirit of God in every way is superior to the stagnant wells of this world and its system. What you've been drinking from and what you have hoped would satisfy and quench your thirst has only left you even more thirsty. The water that you drink from that comes from the world system will never satisfy you. Never. And so he is speaking concerning that, and as he's saying that to her, he's saying, I've got something that is superior. Well, I want this water, she says. I want to drink of this water so I never have to come back and draw water from this well again. So at that point, when she says, I want it, Jesus says, well, go and call your husband. And she looks back at him, and as she's beginning to speak, she says, well, I don't have a husband. I have no husband. And Jesus says, well, that's true. You've had five. And the one that you're living with right now is not your husband. That's right. So what he does is he elicits from her a confession. Well, when he gets her convicted like that, that's right, you've had five men in your life that you called husband, and you're living with a guy right now. He's not your husband. She gets convicted. And what happens when people get convicted? They get religious. I've seen that happen so many times. All of a sudden, they get religious. For her, she says, well, well, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, a mountain called Gerizim. Our, our, our fathers have worshipped on this mountain, but, but you Jews say that you're supposed to worship God in Jerusalem at the temple. And so what does she do? Rather than dealing with her sin, she wants to argue religion. I've, I've talked to people before, and I've said, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I was raised, uh, and then they give me the religious denomination, whatever it might be. You know, I've got a religion. I'm not asking you about your religion. I didn't ask you what you were raised. It's obviously done you no good. So do you know the Lord? That's the real question. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship with God? Why, want, why argue religion? We're not here to argue religion. We're simply asking Jesus and saying, look at, are you thirsty? Yeah, I'm real thirsty. Get your husband. Don't have one. Well, oh, that means you're in sin. Let's deal with that. No, let's talk religion, she says. I don't want to talk religion, Jesus says. No. He says, no, it doesn't really matter. He said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so what the Lord wanted from her was for her to understand that God wants to fill her life with a water that the world will not supply. Turn with me to John chapter 7. I want to show you something else. God can still do that, by the way. God wants to have water pouring into our, our life. Here in Ezekiel, you're seeing the water pouring out from that altar, the place of sacrifice, the ankles, the knees, the waist. It's so deep you have to swim in it. God wants to do work through His Holy Spirit and bless us by the power of the Spirit in our lives. And a great passage that deals with that is found in the Gospel of John chapter 7. Now in John 7, verse 37, John writes, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When he says Jesus was not yet glorified, Jesus had not gone to the cross. He hadn't died. These things had yet to take place. But notice what's happening here. Jesus is there in the city of Jerusalem. And I want to share with you about this living water. I want to speak to you a little bit about this prophecy of the Holy Spirit who, who is going to bless our lives, this Holy Spirit who's going to transform us, this Holy Spirit that will cause us to be able to walk in the power of God, to pray in the power of God to serve God with power and to be so saturated with His blessings and so overwhelmed by Him and, and the abundance of the Spirit because that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's there in Jerusalem and He's celebrating a particular feast. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles, which was an eight-day feast. This particular feast was commemorating the 40 years that the Jews had wandered in the desert. 
And they had been commanded to, to remember that they in the desert had lived in that wilderness in booths. And so as they're there celebrating, this is the last day of the feast. And on this last day of the feast that is being spoken of here, the people would gather together in front of the altar of sacrifice. There'd be a priest there who led a procession to a pool. It's called the Pool of Siloam, which is about a thousand yards just south of the temple, in order that they might draw water. There was a golden pitcher that he had. It was filled with two pints of water, and they would bring it back to the inner temple area. The water would then be poured into a bowl beside the altar, and, and, and from which that water would, would run down a tube into the base of the altar of sacrifice. That water that they would draw was intended to remind them that God had provided water for them when they were in the wilderness. In the morning, when that priest went to the Pool of Siloam to draw the water, the worshipers would accompany him. They would actually march in a procession carrying branches of palms. They would return to the temple as the morning sacrifice was being offered. This procession was a joyous procession. People would be singing. They would be playing music. They would be dancing before the Lord. They would enter in through what was called the water gate. They would be reciting scriptures, like Isaiah 12, 3, which says, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. The priest would carry that water to the altar. The worshipers would hold palm branches. And at that point, they'd be singing psalms, the psalms of praise called the halal, found in Psalm 113 to 118. As they were approaching the altar, the worshipers would shout. They would raise the branches toward the altar. The priests would come. They would march around the altar seven times before pouring out the water. As the priest was about to pour the water, it became very quiet. And as it was very, very quiet, as he's about to pour out that water, a rabbi by the name of Jesus disturbed the entire service because the Bible says that Jesus cried out, saying. So Jesus, as it was quiet and everything is now the most important moment where the priest is about to pour that water there at the altar, Jesus stood and Jesus cried out. And he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's crying out. Commentators say that the way he was crying was with deep emotion. And what he was doing was giving an invitation. He was saying to them, if you're thirsty, you can come to me and you can drink. You see, drinking water in a wilderness was really a picture of the blessings that are associated with Messiah. Isaiah, in chapter 55, verse 1, said, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And so Jesus is saying, you can come to me, you can believe in me, and if you come to me, and if you receive, if you believe in me, then your deepest thirst that you have ever had will be forever quenched. Now, I want you to look at this with me because this is a, an invitation. Notice this is an invitation to anyone. If anyone thirsts, he says. You see, God loves the world, and he desires to draw all people to forgiveness and fulfillment in himself. It's interesting. There are people who will say, well, does God give invitations? You see invitations throughout the Scriptures. You see invitations here where Jesus is saying, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. All the way in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The question is, and I think this is the problem in the church today, is a lot of Christians don't realize how thirsty they are. You can actually get used to not drinking. You can get used to that. I wonder how many of us in this room have ever been totally dehydrated. One of the signs that you're dehydrated is if you get a headache. Whenever we go to Israel, they give to us water bottles. We have to have water all the time because it's very dry. And so if you don't drink your water in the dryness of that climate, you eventually get a headache. And so 
Some people can go a whole day without even realizing that their body is demanding water because it's dehydrating. They end up with headaches, but they didn't even realize they were thirsty. Maria is real good about drinking water, and she's constantly forcing me to, constantly, because I'm somebody who's not really conscious of being thirsty. I just don't think about it, and therefore I just, I just don't realize I am until I get a headache. Well, the Lord is basically saying, listen, you've got to recognize your thirst. And there are believers who go through life, I think, in a pain-filled way because they haven't recognized the need for the water of the Spirit. And yet there's that invitation, Jesus says, if you want, you can come to me if you're thirsty and you're going to find relief. Because when you come to me, I will quench your thirst. So that's what he wants us to do. To find relief, we need to come to him. Psalm 27, verse 4 says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. So one, to find relief, I need to come to him. And finally, I need to drink it personally. He says, if you're thirsty, I will meet your spiritual need. Now, this was occurring at a religious festival. It was a time of great celebration. Yet it's entirely possible to be part of a religious celebration and completely dry inside. It's possible to participate in church services, but your spirit is dry and thirsty. I think a lot of people substitute a relationship with God and His Spirit with just simple religious activity. But you discover that religion is empty. It never fills you. It never satisfies your deeper longings that you have. If I trust my religion, I remain spiritually empty. I was talking to a friend of mine recently question was asked of me, what happened to you? How did you become a Christian? Because this friend I was speaking to uh, hasn't seen me for some time, and so we reconnected, and I was visiting. What happened to you? And I had the opportunity to share for a moment, just for a moment, about being raised in a religious system, about being convinced that my beliefs were right, about thinking that information was making me into a Christian doing certain things within the rituals of my church were supposed to be making me right with God, but that I was empty, absolutely dry inside. There was nothing going on within me. All I had that was truly within me was empty and dry. But then I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ who gave me an invitation to come to Him and to radically transform my life. And when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that emptiness was suddenly filled with the presence of God. That dryness was replaced by the spiritual vigor of the Spirit of God. Something happened, and it wasn't religious. And I was sharing, I'm not a religious person. You know, a lot of times people want to say, well, you're just a religious person. But frankly, I'm not a religious person. I, I don't even like that term. I've never used that term to describe my walk with God. I have a friendship with the Lord. I know God. I have a relationship with God. But religious, no. If you, wanted, if you want to say the behavior that I have is religious, then that's, that's up to the person who's saying that. But if you ask the person who's actually behaving that way, it's not because I've got religious behavior. It's because I have a right relationship with the Lord. You know, I've had people ask me in the past, well, you're, they've said this to me. They've said, you're a Christian. You can't drink anymore. And I've said, I can drink as much as I want. I just don't want to. Oh, you're a Christian. You can't smoke pot anymore. You know what? Uh, I can smoke pot if I want. I just don't want to. God took the cravings away from me. God took those things from me. I don't have a desire to do that anymore. I have no hunger to do that anymore. No, it's not because I'm old and I've outgrown that. I've seen some pretty old sinners. They never outgrew it. They, they got worse. There's hardly anything like an old sinner, you know. They're, they're experts. They're black belts. I mean, there's something else. No, I, you know, you, you lie long enough, you can become very good at it. You steal long enough, you can become very good at it. You continue in sin for a long time, you, that's your way of life. That's the way you are. But you're miserable. And I was just fortunate in the Lord that I was 20 years old when he grabbed hold of me. I could have gone longer without him, but I didn't, and I thank God for that. But the bottom line is, is that God's saying, look, if you want to have what I have for you, it's not going to be in religious activity. It's going to be in a relationship with me. And that's why Jesus is speaking to people who are busy at religion. That's why he's doing this. There they are in this very spectacular moment. It's a tradition that they've had since the wilderness days. And they're celebrating the tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. 
And there they are about to pour that water out. And when it's absolutely quiet there, Jesus cries out and says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. It's an invitation that God gives to us. Religion alone cannot meet my deepest needs. What it does is it dresses up my outer man, but it never touches my heart. Well, Jesus says this. Jesus says, if I want to have this, I need to come to him. In Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, Jesus said, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Any father in this room, if your kid asks you for something, you don't give him something that will harm him if you love your kid. And Jesus is saying, listen, you're evil, but you still do good to your babies. And haven't you come to realize that your father isn't evil and he will give you the Holy Spirit? And he gives the Holy Spirit to you when you ask him. I got saved. Forgive me for reminiscing openly. But I got saved in one of the more exciting periods of history. I got saved during what was called the Jesus Movement. And the Jesus Movement is just that. It's a movement of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people. Radical transformations. That's why I was so blessed this last Sunday with Sonny and with Ryan because that's what I know. That's, that's the transformations that I've seen. A lot of the people that you know by reputation, the Mike McIntoshes, the Raul Reeses, the Jeff Johnsons, the Steve Mazes, the Greg Lorries, these men who have been walking with the Lord for 39, 40 years, men like Pastor Chuck Smith, These are people that are, are friends of mine. They're, these are people that I, that I hang around with. These are people that I know. And I've seen what God does. I've seen the transformations. I've, I've seen the work of the Spirit of God. And it isn't religion. It never has been. We've had people come to this church who have studied it to try and figure out how they could duplicate what God does by His Spirit. That doesn't work. My greatest longing is not to have a large church. My greatest longing is to have a group of people who love the Lord Jesus Christ gathering together just to enjoy Him together as church family. It's never been one of those, let's see how big we can build it and see if they'll show up. You know, one of those, the, if you build it, they will come mentalities. That's not the way it is. What it is and what it has always been is a work and activity of the Holy Spirit. And God is the one who transforms life. That's why I was so blessed when I heard Ryan saying this last Sunday how that he was so involved with drugs and made a decision to go to rehab. But he says, I started reading the Word of God. I started following Jesus. I didn't go to rehab. And, 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 and many people were blessed and touched by that because they understood that. You know what that means. I didn't have to go to rehab. I didn't have to go and have some classes. I didn't have to go to some counselor to, to talk me out of the, the pain and the memories and the, and the gr regret and all. I didn't have to do that. You know, so many people have those 12-step programs. I took the one step. I came to Jesus Christ, and He transforms lives. And that comes by the power of the Spirit. And that's what we need. And, and I am so sold on that. If I ever get to the point where I start thinking it comes any other way, I will step out of this pulpit. I don't believe it comes any other way. It comes by the power of the Spirit of God. That's how it comes. When you finally say, God, I can't take it. I am so thirsty and I am so dry and I can't do this anymore. 
God, fill this empty vessel. Change my life. I'm tired. That's what happened to me. And, and, and I had bad influences. You know, it didn't come from Calvary. We wanted to go to, to various places to, to get more of God. And on one occasion, my friend Bill uh, and a couple of other guys well, said, We've got, let's go to Long Beach. There's a revival taking place in this small church on, on Cherry. And so off we went to Long Beach, and, and we went to this church. It was a very small church having a revival. It had this big old sign, Revival, Holy Spirit Fire. And so here we are, these hippies. I mean, we are brand new in the Lord. We just want more of Jesus. And we show up in this teeny little church with this Pentecostal pastor who's got a drum set at the platform, at the base of the platform. And he had a pompadour, this huge old blonde pompadour. And he was shouting at us and swinging his handkerchief around. And he got us marching around that, that church behind a flag. And we were doing all kinds of goofy things. And then, then when he'd get like just... All excited, he would just go down there and he'd get up behind those drums and start beating on the drums and we'd all jump around. And, and I thought, this is good. This is Christian aer aerobics. You know, this is fine. There's something wrong with this. What do I know? I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know this is wrong. I don't know. They're saying, beg God, beg God, beg God for the Spirit. And, and, and I'm oh God, oh God, you know, and we're shouting. 20-year-old hippie with a bunch of crazy people, you know. And then they said, come to the altar and ask God for the Spirit. Beg God for the Spirit. I knelt at that altar for an hour, an hour, begging God. And next to me were all of these Protestant Pentecostals. I came out of the Catholic Church, and I knew I could stay on my knees longer than any Protestant could do. <laughs> I can do this. It became a flesh thing for me. And I'm yelling, God, fill me, God. Fill me with the Spirit. <laughs> and then they had us get in a line and get behind a microphone and give a testimony, and nothing had happened to me. And I'm standing in line, and people are getting behind the mic. Oh, you know, heaven opened up, and, and I'm thinking, God, nothing happened. And I can't lie anymore. I'm a Christian. What can I do? I'll never forget this waiting in line saying, God, I don't want to lie. Nothing happened till I was finally behind, just like I am right now. And I looked at this small group of people all looking at me with expectant eyes, wanting to hear something very powerful. And I looked at them and I said, I really can't put into words <laughs> what I just went through. <laughs> That's what I said. That was true. <laughs> and they all looked at me like, yeah, nothing happened to us either, but we're not behind the mic, right? <laughs> Everything you're not supposed to do, we were doing. Screaming, crying, tearing, begging. And Jesus said, ask. Your Father will give you something good. Ask. I didn't even think about that. And later on, I learned how foolish I was. Jesus' movement is the Spirit movement. God's Holy Spirit pouring out into our lives, setting us free, radically transforming us, taking kids who were wasted, Wasted. I used to have a kilo of marijuana in my bedroom. That was my private stash. Every day, every day, I'd roll three joints first thing in the morning. My mom would leave for work. I'd roll three joints, bombers, big ones. I don't know what they're called now. They were called bombers then. I'd smoke one. I put two behind my ears, climb in my Volkswagen, and drive until I smoke the other two. I'd start out my day that way, every day. Every day, just rolling joints, smoking pot, every day. My Fridays started with a quart of beer and a half gallon of wine. That's how I started my Friday nights. And I was doing that 
consistently over the course of several months. And in one month, because I got so heavy into it, I dropped from 178 pounds to 145 pounds because I stopped eating and all I did was drink and smoke pot. That's what I did my last month. I got to the point where I almost died of an overdose. And that's when I began to start thinking, I'm only 20 years old. I just can't go this route. And that's when my friend Bill was hammering me and hammering me. And that's when I would argue with him constantly. And I would say to him, I already know God. No, I knew religion, but I didn't know God. I didn't know the power of the Spirit that God says is going to pour out. You're going to walk in it. You're going to pray. You're going to be anointed to serve. It's going to overwhelm and drench your life. I didn't know that until I got saved. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ saved me, I began as a new believer, 20 years old, began by simply saying, God, I hate what I am. I need you to make me something else. See, some people know what that was like at one time, but something has interrupted the flow. When this church building was first built, we had a heavy rain, and it started leaking from the tiles, the roof tiles. We, we, we actually had to put buckets in the back of this, this hall here to catch the water because the water was seeping through and we had to send some guys on top of the roof and they began to look and it was puddled, it was pooled up there and we knew where the, the spouts were, the drains and they went to the drain and they stuck their hands inside the drain and began to pull out debris. There was debris inside the drain. And when they pulled the debris out and cleaned out the drain, the water was able to pour out once again. And finally, the water began to flow. Sometimes in our lives, we have debris, anger. We have bitterness, unforgiving hearts. We're callous to sin. We deal with envy. Sometimes people are involved in sexual sin. They're filled with hatred or indifference or jealousy. They're just lazy spiritually. They're filled with pride. They, they're selfish. They're vulgar. There's so many things. They reject the things of the Spirit of God. They don't want to be a good father. They don't want to be a good mom. They don't want to be a good role model. They don't want any of that. And they wonder what's going on. Well, what's happened is, is you've clogged that pipe. It has to be cleaned out. I believe that God wants to move, but the church is so busy and many in the church are so busy living carnal lives that God isn't moving at all in their life. And I think that sometimes we need to simply get real with God and say, God, be merciful to me. I need your help. God wants to do that work. You see, in Ezekiel, and I'm going to close here. I have to. In Ezekiel... God is promising that he's going to pour out his blessings. Now, that water that we see there is a picture of his blessings. It's a symbol or a type of the Spirit, but it also has practical application because the children of Israel are going to need water to survive. And God is saying, I'm going to not only cause you to survive, I'm going to cause you to thrive because this water that's going out is going to be a place that is life. It's going to produce life. You're going to have fish on the banks of the river. There'll be trees. They're going to be producing fruit for you to eat and healing for you through the leaves. And God is simply saying, I've got something very practical to do. I'm going to do a work to refresh you. This water is going to roll down all the way to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is, is, a, is a place that is, is six or seven times saltier than, than any ocean. Nothing can survive in it. But God is saying, I'm going to give it life. You're going to be able to spread your nets there. I'm going to be producing for you in that place there. And, and all of this is going to take place because I'm going to pour my spirit out in you. And I'm going to do a work in you. And the bottom line is, and you can read this with me. I'll read the last verse. It's found in chapter 48. And the bottom line is at verse 35, the last few words, after he speaks about the land and his presence and what he's going to do, he simply says, the Lord is there. The curse is removed. God will be blessing. And the Lord is there. 
I want the Lord to not only be there, which he will be, but I want the Lord to be here. And I want the Lord to be here in my life. And I've finally gotten to that point in my life where I'm saying to the Lord, God, I just want more of you. I just want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of your spirit. I want more of your presence. I want more of your, your gifting. I want more of your fruit in my life. I want more Jesus. Lord, I don't want to just walk ankle deep. I don't want to remain knee deep or waist deep. I want an abundance of your flowing power in my life. I think that's what we all ought to be asking for so that God can move in us.